Bingo, there we go. Okay, so I'll wait till it comes up on my phone. All right, so viewers, fans, and subscribers all the same out there in the audience for Tax City and Iacon and the FGC. Welcome to episode three of the Space Bridge. Join with me here in the next segment here as I continue my travels through the heart of the fighting game communities that we know. Join with me here today, tonight, is a fellow freedom fighter that's continuing to fight for the continued preservation of Melty Blood, both with Actress again and with Type Lumina. I'd like to introduce you guys to Arkham Muddy Kips. Hello, hello. All right, and cue. So how you been out there through this week? I'm doing all right. Uh, a lot of work, a lot of not work. Just kind of existing at the moment, uh, working on stuff, both in the scene and in life. Uh, a lot of projects and all that. I feel that. And it's good to try and keep yourself busy sometimes. That way you can keep the prerogatives alive for... Uh, always like thinking on the fly or yeah having having creativity not be unfelt un unfelt yeah I, the hardest part is like you get your mind juices a running and you realize you're just one person so he's just like trying to get that all together to to work out could be difficult but as long as you tackle the ones you're really passionate about it's like i can make this i can make this work uh one step at a time yeah, yeah. So I guess going into the background for yourself, what brought you into into playing fighting games, or brought you into the the FGC in general? Before we even go into talking about Melty Blood, let's delve into you. So my initial passion for fighting games, in a very general sense, was uh, I was a Smash player. Um, when I was growing up in like high school, I got really into Melee, but like I didn't really play it that much. It was like I was watching the the scene as it was developing. And um, eventually when I went to college, uh, there was a Smash scene near me, or not near me, but in my college. So I would go there and I played Smash for a little bit. And uh, around 2018, I got into Guilty Gear uh, Exard. I sucked at it, but I was really enjoying like the music and a lot of the other stuff in it. And uh, that was like my first foray for fighting games. Uh, I remember I played Undernight for a bit. Uh, some uh, semesters of class, it was literally me like getting to class early, pulling out my laptop and practicing combos before the start of class. Uh, I never really like played in brackets for Undernight for a while. Um, that was mostly a just a game I would kind of play on my own, maybe with one or two people in an area at the college. But that was mostly it. I was mostly still a, a Smash player. Uh, I played all, I play all the all the Smash games. So I was an Ultimate player, Smash sixty four player, B plus player, Melee player. So I kind of like my main oh, thing was I played all of them. Yeah, no, I would I would go to all the different weeklies for the games. Uh, I started initially with Smash four. Uh, it was like Smash four and Smash sixty four. Uh, my local at the time had both games, and so I entered both like all the time. And then the day before would be Melee, so I would play Melee. And around twenty eighteen, I found the P plus scene, so I started playing that game. But um, after, like, during lockdown, uh, when we had the, the initial start of the pandemic, um, I was looking for games to play. And uh, I know uh, Juicy Game Night's Duelist, because um, he's one of my local TOs. And he recommended oh. I play Dengeki. And so I started playing a little bit of Dengeki. Um, oh, you hopped on a nice little piece of crack with that community. Like, that, that game yeah, was Dengeki. actually a nice little gem. Dengeki's a lot of fun, and I played that for a little bit, and I play it again on and off, just to ca more casually, occasionally for events. Um, oh, and by the way, Chad, if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about Dengeki Bunko Fighting Climax. Check it out, it's a really nice game. But yeah, that was like my reintroduction to French Bread. Um, I liked the game because it was really simple. Uh, I'm, a very, I'm a very simple person when it comes to my fighting games. I'm like, just give me the buttons... Give me maybe some simple commands, and I can go. I can go crazy with those. Uh, but after playing that for a little bit over the pandemic, uh, we start to get let out again. Um, here in Florida, I mean, we got out early, but 
I was still very much in a, I don't like want to do anything. Like there were stuff that was popping back up again in the state, but uh, I was mostly just focused on keeping myself okay and healthy. And I ended up working like that entire time until like 2021. And I started like slowly traveling back out. And at the end of the year, I believe it was at the end of 2021, um, I had a friend of mine recommend me uh, picking up Melty Blood. Uh, so the game comes out in like the end of September, early October, somewhere around there. And this is one of my Smash friends. And I was like, sure, I'll pick it up. And I actually, I do have some videos of like my initial days playing the game. I was very casual, just like trying to get into it, trying to figure out how to play the game. And I didn't like, it didn't click with me right off the bat. But I started to really like it. Uh, I was still trying to find a character. Um, I tried to get a little local going with someone, uh, but we didn't really get too many people. So I was mostly a casual player. Uh, maybe occasionally I would hop on, um, I would hop online and play on ranked. And then like two two kind of big things happened. Uh, the first one was I actually I actually found someone near me who like played the game pretty good, and that was Medusa. Um, I feel like I shouldn't have to elaborate on who Medusa is, but he's a, a really, really good uh, flop he player. Is a, he is one of the more notable Melty Blood players of our current timeline. Yeah, and as I interacted with him, I didn't really realize how really good he was. Um, I would just, <laughs> I was just like play him and get my ass kicked, and then I go, "Oh, this game's really cool. I want to keep playing this." Uh, they also released Powered CL, and I was like. Oh, this character is really cool. I already had started learning CL um, around that time, and then when she came out, I was like, "I'm of course I'm gonna play this character. She's got a gun. That's awesome." Um, I used that time as well to start playing through Tsukihime on the original. I was just like, "Oh, this could be interesting. Let me try that out." Uh, and then CEO 2022 uh, is when like I go 0 and 2 in the bracket, but I go, "I really want to put more time into this game. I'm like getting more and more addicted to it." And I then spent like the next six months hard grinding ranked, looking up VODs, playing in brackets wherever I could. And that kind of like started it. The first bracket I ever entered for uh, Actors Again would be that year's CEO Otaku. Super beginner player. I'm still very bad at that game. But I really like the, the games and a lot of the people that are in it. So I, I try to play that when I can. But it was mostly like a, a Lumina thing for me. Uh, Lumina just kind of grew in... in what I wanted to do, and I started traveling a lot more for the game since it was like, well, I'm not traveling to locals as much anymore because I don't really need to, and I because there's not really anything near me, so I'll try and travel out more instead. Uh, and then over the course of 2023, I was on the road a lot more than I was ever used to. Uh, so when I played Smash, I mostly stayed locally. Um, the yeah, only time like I really out mainly towards like the like close like. Uh, yeah, I like I would and stuff. Yeah, because when I was really into Smash, I was mostly still in college, so I was mostly staying within my state. Maybe rarely I would travel like super far north or south. Um, so I'm in Central Florida, so maybe I would travel up to Jacksonville once or twice. Uh, the only thing I ever traveled out to out of state specifically for Smash was Super Smash Con in 2019, uh, and that was really fun. Uh, and then. After the pandemic, I would travel to SmashCon again in, tw I think, 22. And then I also traveled to Low Tide City 2021 and 2022 out in uh, Texas. But outside of that, like, by the time 2022 was coming and, like, going, and I was getting more and more into Melty Blood, I started playing Smash a lot less. Uh, I still like work with some Smash stuff from time to time. Uh, I help TO a event in Florida for like Smash 64 and Project Plus because I love those games a lot. Uh, and we also have Melee. But Lumina slowly started to overtake it. And you could really see that because I started traveling to a lot of events because of it. Uh, every so often, I end up bringing it back up on stream. In 2023 alone, I was like, my my schedule was really stacked like month for month. So like in January I had Frosty Faustings and that was my like right after that event I found out what the Panic Shield Anonymous Discord was, which is like the the main North America hub. Um then I try I had my own event, uh, Oceanfront that I host semi-annually in January. Then I think 
that May, I traveled out to uh, to Combo Breaker for the first time. Uh, that was the first time I, I made it out of pools, uh, was at Combo Breaker for Illumina. And then I had CEO, which is thankfully near me. I had my second Oceanfront event uh, that year in July. Uh, in August, uh, Medusa and I traveled out to Evo, and that was a really cool time. And then September was CEO Otaku, which again is in my backyard. After that, I then went to first attack in Puerto Rico uh, for Melty Blood. And then I traveled out to uh, a Smash 64 event in Arizona called Battle at the Border, uh, which just had its uh, last bracket uh, like two weeks ago. It had, like, but uh, that was it. Went on hiatus? No, so they had the their first time in 2023, and then they had their next one this year, like two weeks ago. Oh, okay. So okay. it's like a it's like an annual event. Yeah. yeah okay. But and then that was going to be my my last event of the year and that was really rough because first attack into battle at the border was like two weeks apart so i flew to puerto rico flew back was at work for like maybe a week and a half and then flew to arizona um and i was like you know what that's it that's my last travel thing there's no way i could fit anything else into the schedule i'm gonna chill over december and next time i have frosties in january and i'll use this time to like get back into myself and then I, I traveled out to Connecticut in December for a, a regional called Hog, Hog Dark Side. Oh. But, um, yeah, I, I, I've traveled a lot for this game. I have a, a really big passion for this game. I've competed a ton online. I've completed a ton off uh, offline. Uh, and I don't see a reason for me to stop just yet. So I, I plan to kind of keep it keep it rolling. That's like a, a very brief history of me playing this video game. It's a very thorough one. It might not sound like a lot, but that is a that is a pretty good amount regarding traveling out in order to meet each event that you can, meeting a lot of the people and uh, and fellow people that also appreciate either Melty Blood by the game or the manga or the IP. And yeah, and if we wanted to talk about all that. Game community. We could get into that in like all of 2024 because 2024 ended up being like even more and I'm like still trying to plan out like possible stuff for next year. So it, it is, there's a lot to this scene and a lot to the, the games and the IP itself that um, kind of bring people in. I think you can really stick around with it if you get that uh, style of investment in. Okay. Do you feel like there was more given for the for the enriching aspect for Melty Blood in 2024 compared to 2023 or even 2022? Um, I, it's hard for me to comment on 2022. I was very much like an outsider. I wasn't really like in the know for things. Um, I will say I think 2024 kind of had a culmination. Like late 2023 to 2024, there was a lot of uh, culminating stuff. So we had Evo in 2023. Uh, Taku was another really big event. Uh, very hyped up. We had uh, the Panic Shield Anonymous uh, Circuit 2. Which will be a highlight for me and my video game playing career. Uh, it was really cool being a part of like a full-on circuit. Uh, getting to play. Um, I got to see myself go up against a lot of people. Get a lot of experience. And the culminating summit at the end of it was really fun. And then we also had some really cool like meetup events. Combo Breaker was a cool one because we got to see some people who don't really come offline as much. Um, a lot of these events are just, I'm meeting people who I've interacted with a bunch online and getting to meet them. 2023 was kind of basic for that. 2024 felt like this is like, oh no, I actually know y'all now. Um, yeah. Same thing with like Crossover Arc. Crossover Arc in New York, I got to meet uh, Empirist uh, who runs the Waz Gaming events because uh, that's his event. Um, and I got to meet a whole bunch of people doing that. It's just a lot of like investing in meeting up with people at these events, getting to play the game we like offline, which feels so good. And then it also, these also double down a lot of times as like a, a trip to, to travel out and see different things to try and get as much as I can out of a, a visit before I have to come back home. Hey, it makes sense. Optimize it to optimize what you're, what you're spending that way. It's not hurting the wallet too much. Yep. Oh, we'll see. Yeah, you went to the background, you talked on the past seasons and competition and a lot of the, the landscape offline and the experiences. 
uh, let's delve into the state of play. So let's delve into like the communal aspect of the of the video game, be it the its influence and the content making portion or aspect of it. Mm -hmm. The state of Melty Blood. It's been a very tricky roller coaster since it since it since it got a fighting game. But it's been but it's had a lot of love to it, so it's not fallen off the bandwagon. It's just been difficult in order to stay on it. It's it's tricky. So like Lumina as a fighting game, I think has been in the most awkward spot for a modern fighting game. It was a very polarizing release. Uh, it, it has changed so much since that 2021 release. Like, the game is so mechanically different than that. But it's still very much stuck with that early stigma of what the game was. Um, but also, it didn't stop it from developing a pretty large scene. But a lot of the players that were there at the beginning have either moved on, shifted, or adapted and you have a lot of newer blood in the water that kind of came in around like 2023, maybe late 2022, uh, that have kind of replaced that older guard. And the game's still getting a lot of newer people. Um, on the content side, it's also kind of stuck in this like in between two worlds kind of thing, where on the one hand, it got some pretty good content like really early on from the community, and then it kind of gets whittled down a little bit. We are kind of at a little impasse where I think there should be a growing development of that soon. Um, but like I could probably label like some of the most important things that we currently have. Uh, we do have a, the one thing we do have is a lot of brackets, a lot of beginner friendly brackets, especially to get people into the game. Um, on the, the content side of things, more recently, uh, you may have like a few things like uh, Phantom's Offense Guide which is a really good tool to learn how to kind of play the game and how to apply your offense within the, the state of Lumina that it currently exists in. Uh, you have people like Kerbo. Uh, Kerbo is a TO who runs a beginner intermediate bracket called Kerbo Cup, but he's also made a lot of really interesting videos breaking down how characters work, sets just that he would play, um, and he's worked on like the wiki and more recently he's been working on these really cool short form videos to explain like really interesting uh, Lumina specific concepts in like really nice uh, bites that the kids are all into these days. Um, aside from that, the only like other major content things I could think of that aren't directly like running a tournament. Uh, I run a, a show called Melting Core that I've got think seven episodes it's soon to be eight uh about uh, events that we have in north america uh the last one i did was covering climax of night just before it happened and i like to use that as a way to get people interested in what the events are and to find out like who's going and like some of the bigger names i currently have the next one scripted up as well so uh that'll be breaking down the event so it's like one video talks about the the event coming up and then the next video is all right, here's what happened, here were the results, and here's, like, who was able to do it. And that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, I have been a proponent of more things being made, uh, and we've definitely tried in the community to work on some things like that. Uh, for example, over the summer, Kikoho ran this thing. Uh, it was, like, a newsletter called Monday Morning Melty. Uh, there's various other versions of this. Um, I think there's a Monday Morning Mithra ran by a Trade War for Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Uh, essentially, it's like every week on a Monday, we make a little write-up that people can read talking about like anything within the community, be it like a character, a player, a scene. And that was really cool. So one of the ones he did was on why we use... Yeah, we use like a, a little thing of why people use a certain color, uh, I wrote an article for it uh, one week uh, where I talked about my experience with a character uh, that I used over the course of July just as a way to learn her. And I kind of just jotted down my experiences. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we can uh, produce stuff like that. And I think for Lumina, because it's not really in the uh, the main zeitgeist of uh, competitive play, 
and it's starting to kind of back away, but it's still a really new and a really accessible game that we're kind of in control of its destiny here in North America, where if we push the game hard again, even if we don't get to like the highest of numbers, we can get people interested and more engaged with the game now than say we were even in like 2022 or 2023. Um, and there's definitely a lot that even like newer players can get into, uh, older players can help out with. And I, I think over the course of the end of 2024 into 2025, we could start seeing that shift happen. Uh, we're not really sure what the state of the, the game itself is. We think maybe we might be on like a one-year patch kind of situation. Um, so we had a patch in 2023 in May, and we right. really stuck with that till twenty like late 2024, or early 2024 we and that other one yeah yeah it was really awkward though so if you went from like november to let's say march people were like people who are more interested in other games or needing to kind of have that game patched out as much as possible um over like a more frequent amounts of time started kind of ebbing away and the people who are still like getting into the game and are still enjoying what it was were still willing to stay. And then we got that next patch. And the patch did a lot to to even balance out the issues that people still may have had with the game. Um, we could say it still has its issues. Of course, I think nothing will be perfect, but I think the the most recent changes were so nice for the overall state of the game. It was that nice, even nice now changes. Like I didn't think that the like um uh, the palette changes just to do more color palette would actually bring like so much good wealth for all the characters even the lesser played characters got something out of it it was a it was a win win i can't even i no, can't get yeah. anything wrong that was wrong with that patch uh the only thing wrong with that patch was they didn't nerf roa enough no, Suckers, um, i spoke too soon chat uh no no no, but um, th the last patch was really good. It was it was genuinely good. I would say it's probably like an 8 or 9 out of 10. Um, the only thing that they had to do is they had to rush a second patch because they had some issues uh, with the maids uh, duo. Um, so they had to do like a really quick like quick fix after that because uh, they had some small issues. That's but no, it's been really so fun. fun. And if you have like the state of the game itself, you can look at online, you can look at offline results, and the people that are putting in like the serious effort to stay good at this game are still really good. Um, but you still have a lower pool of people that are like nipping at people's heels, and it gets kind of closer and closer by the day. Um, it, it is really... It's really cool to get to see um, all the people. Like, if you watch Climax this year, and you were just looking at like the top 32... The top 32 was insane. The pools were insane. There were some pools where you would have like five or six players who you'd all expect to get like top 16. And they were fighting for their life to get out, even on loser side. Uh, I think I think the games... My top number one character got buffed, so yeah, the patch was pretty good. I see. A lot of characters, a lot of characters got some really interesting buffs, for sure. Um, it was just buffs, really gave, like, uh, What is it? Uh, Neko, uh, Neko Arc. That was actually like hilarious. Yeah, no, I. If there's one thing you can give Lumina, even for like Nekoar, the game is really balanced. Yeah, you have like the really busted characters. Then you've got the characters that are still pretty busted, and then you've got the characters that are really good. They might just have to work a little harder. But like that's kind of it. Like, even Neko, to an extent, we're kind of seeing this little, like, Neko thing again. So, originally, like, the main Nekos you'd have are, like, Salt Prophet and uh, Kiri, or Kuri. Not not to be confused with Noel and Arkwood player Kiri. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I think um, Marathon was another one. But more recently, uh, we've had um, more people either on the Neko or kind of dabbling with the with the character so you're seeing that character pop up in even like beginner intermediate brackets or just oftentimes in like other people's streams the character is solid a character requires a lot of talent to properly pilot which people don't want to give credit to but no that character can do damage the character can run oki the character can run mix uh she just has like the worst things to deal with in some of these matchups that can make her hard but which makes sense even then you have to use can... rng in order to kind of help navigate neutral it's partially RNG. It's also partially just some of the characters, especially more recently, have dealt have certain ways to deal with Neko things. 
like uh, Deco gets a lot off of causing chaos. The chaos doesn't have yeah. to necessarily be something they understand, but they know like enough of how to navigate it. But some characters just have like, no, you don't get to do this to me anymore. Buttons. Uh, everyone has the universal uh, heat into shield, but some characters even have a little more that can make that really difficult to properly set up. But it's on the Neko player to kind of navigate around those things. But the game itself, it is in a really good state. The The competitive scene is in a, I think, overall good state for the amount of people that play and the people that hop in. Um, I just think it's the, the content space, which I think people are getting more interested in developing again. Uh, we've been in a very awkward spot for that for the last few years. And I think that'll be the one place you'll see more and more of develop as the the game continues in its life more of the uh the con more of the content route yeah i think i think that'll be something that we see a, a higher development in that uh as long as you kind of have your ear to the to the veins you'll you'll be able to hear uh what's cooking from a lot of people not just from like the more familiar people who are starting to get back into it but even from people you may not expect to get from that Okay. I like the I like the I like the positivity in the direction of the community because I think longevity wise, I feel like this game prospers a lot from like in terms of like what you get what you and your friends have done in trying to tell stories through the video game. I think has given an alternate route of interest in playing the game and picking up characters and really falling in love with characters and expanding on a lot of their background history. That's the thing with. So as a as a Smash player, I grew up with Melee, and the Melee community as a, a whole has developed an identity around good stories and narrative about like the players and the game itself. And I think a lot of us understand that there's like a similar beating heart here. Um, games will survive off of its community alone if need be, and I think a lot of us in this community are fully ready to kind of show why we think this this game kind of deserves to keep on kicking um lumina is in relative relation to actors again it's a very different game and not as um it's not as tied to the the franchise like that and so a lot of mbac players are mostly mbac players there's definitely crossover whereas some a lot of lumina players may not play actress again but a lot of them do dabble with it um, it kind of has to forge its own unique path uh, akin to like the difference between like Melee and any of the other Smash games. Um, it's a very, it's its own unique beast with a similar idea, but it really inverts what the idea of Melty Blood is. And I think that that is the biggest thing that'll, that'll come to change is the people that like Lumina for what Lumina does, especially now. Uh, are going to be more vocal about that and try and fight the the overall stigma of what it was at the beginning of its game. Uh, whereas Actress, again, kind of is in its spot because its community has spent the years developing its identity uh, through its resources, through its kind of stories, or through um, just the, the moments that they want to publicize and, and talk about. Like, everyone knows the, the Wara memes that have come out recently. Um, the Satsuki command grab get, uh, image is iconic. You've got a lot of really interesting things. The fucking the the close enough uh, the Wi-Fi being close enough. Oh, yeah. uh, there, there's a lot of that there, and I think Lumina is going to see its development where that part of it kind of adds on top of that, but also develops it in its own little way. But I think I think the future is bright. If um, if people decide we want to put the investment in, I think it will be there. Okay. Another thing I also wanted to delve into briefly was uh, with st it also delves into the state of play with communities. I noticed that the community of Actress again and the communities of Type Luminar are both kind of interlocked. Like one kind of helps one kind of helps the other, and they're both like two sides of the same coin in terms of key informs the longevity of the IP of Melty Blood. So how does Melty Blood actress again help in laying the groundwork out for uh, Lumina building off of that? Actress again as like it's kinda like the last game in like the, the old canon. Um 
so it has a lot of characters that Lumina doesn't have. So if you're coming in from Actress again, you may just be waiting for those characters to come into Lumina or and the new canon. It's like its own bag of worms, but because it has that development of like history to it, it can get people engaged even with Lumina, where they're like, well, it doesn't have this character, but I know eventually they'll come, so I better get used to the game now. Um, and for Lumina, it's there's a lot of, especially recently, there's a lot of Lumina players that have been trying actors again out more. Um, people that get invested in the lore, because if you get into the remake canon, which only just recently got into its uh, official English release, it's like, huh, I, I need some form of content to identify what's going on here. Uh, and then you maybe look at the old canon through like the manga or the game, and you're like, oh, this is really cool. Let me play this other game that they had uh, beforehand and get into it. Uh, the communities themselves, I think there's a lot of crossover and, and people chatting about on like how to run things. So maybe you'll have the the crossover. But the game it's, itself are they're definitely their own distinct scene uh, scenes and want to kind of show that off. But it, if it means working together to host events, like we have climax, so the Lumina scene and the Actors Against scenes are both there in full force. Um, it's going to mean helping out and getting there. Uh, I guess a good example is Actors Again had a few uh, players that they had for their fund who also play uh, Lum uh, also play Lumina, like Donnie and Xiao. So that's just like a nice crossover that ends up happening because you invite a player who just happens to play both. Um the same thing with like I also Moai uh, that Moai came over for climax and you have that crossover there. Uh, in terms of like direct workings together, um, I know uh, Training Mode Network they host both Lumina and Actress again for their brackets for beginners and intermediates. And I think there's a lot of smaller stuff that I probably am not even privy to that have come on like a grassroots level of the two communities working together. Uh, I for example I try to host when I can so. When I host my offline uh, Oceanfront events, uh, I host Lumina and Actress Again. Uh, I've TO'd Actress Again twice now at CEO as a side event. And I'm also tonight actually hosting an Actress Again bracket for Florida uh, online. So I, I try to, to have my own personal contribution to the game. My, my thing with Actress Again is I'm like, I'm not as good at it and I don't vibe with it as much. I still really like the game and I think watching it's really cool and I want to at least help out and do what I can for them as well uh, as I try to help out with Lumina and I think for some people it's kind of the opposite side of the spectrum where they're like oh yeah we can totally help out and make sure we got some Lumina stuff going on or even with other scenes uh, outside of that I think when you're playing a game series that's a little more low key and you're just like we really like this game and we just want to talk about this game and get other people to try it out um, you kind of have that like growth or um, it's like an infectious uh, attitude that people kind of latch on to. It's like, yeah, the game's cool, but people really like this game. So that gets me more interested in playing it or trying it out. And I think for both communities, there's a, a sense of that. Okay, and I can believe that. Because there's a lot of visual, there's a lot of nostalgia. Sometimes, honestly, for some people, there's a lot of nostalgia in playing Melty Blood. There's a lot of intrigue. The story is all there. It's constant. There's a lot to potentially love about the game if you give it a chance. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely got like a little bit of everything um, that you would like with it. I think that it gets the benefit of being a part of like a pre-existing canon or story. Uh, a lot of, I think a lot of fighting games, it can be kind of hit or miss because you have to give your fighting game a story and that ends up not really being really invested in much. Whereas for Lumina, even if like the, the individual stories are, are pretty cut and dry and it's like, oh, you're going to go through this character. It has the background of going, yeah, but we're actually from this whole story. Uh, and even like with the, the guest characters, it's like, yeah. And then there's also the fate universe, which is its own giant thing um that will have its own people come in from so there's a lot to latch on to and then it's like oh yeah and then this is also a fighting game that you can play right now on your your steam or your playstation or your switch or xbox okay uh next thing i wanted to delve into was regarding the state of play and the dlc because there's some games that fall into the mantra of interest or intrigue 
only when DLCs are abundant, because usually stuff always comes with a DLC. It'd be a, besides a new character, you have the expansion of the roster, or possibly even a patch. It's something that will also shake up things that come with the new character. I noticed that in this game, there's always a genuine wish list for who comes into play for uh, this game, or, or yeah, for Melty Blood type Lumina. And I want to ask your opinion on, do you feel like DLC or the expansion thereof plays a role heavily or lightly in its continued interest, like similar to like an Uzuki in Undernight or a Vikala or a Versusia in Grand Blue or uh, the Chaos Reigns pack of Mortal Kombat? So as I mentioned earlier, like the the ending of 2023, uh, 2023 into 2024, that was like big time. So it had been a while. I think it had been about a year since the last characters dropped um, and like a while after the, the last update dropped. And a lot of people were like, oh, these this isn't this isn't really changing. They might just be done. The game might be over. They're not really adding anything. And a lot of people kind of need that like reinsurance from the developer that oh yeah we are making things and things are coming out um on the character side it, so we were talking about like the the pre-existing lore and uh the the basis of a canon lumina as a part of the remake canon kind of gets double-edged sworded in that effort where because the the parent company of Type Moon and its writer Nasu are redeveloping like Tsukihime with the remake, they haven't actually adapted the second part. And Melty Blood as a franchise started as a continuation, I think like a year or two later, off the original Tsukihime story in its own little canon, that they can't really introduce a majority of the characters from Melty Blood because they aren't there yet and since we don't know when exactly that next part will happen we can't really tell when these characters will be added um so characters like sion or satsuki aren't gonna get added really until they get like properly introduced uh as they are within their story be it in the visual novel or right after for the next melty blood game but a lot of people want those characters. Another one that's really popular is Len. A lot of people like Len, but she's only been like teased. She's not properly in the game. Um, so if you go back to Actors Again, where all these characters are there, it's like, we want these characters, and the best thing we can do is go to Actors Again again. Um, and that hurts. That definitely does hurt for people. So there's the people who are tied into the lore who are missing a character they want to play, and now you don't get to play the game uh, because you don't have the characters you want. Or it becomes, I want to play a fighting game that still feels like there's life in it and is being directly supported. It needs the direct dopamine uh, being injected into the video game or I'm going to lose interest when there's other things coming out. Uh, during that same timeline, we had uh, Grand Blue versus uh, Rising come out and a lot of people started de playing that a lot more. Uh, then Undernight 2 came out, and a lot of the Undernight people who were playing Melty Blood till an Undernight sequel came out, they started going over there. And so the game got kind of hit with like a one two punch of, okay, so we're now going to be a lot of the people that really like Melty Blood and don't really vibe with some of these other games. But you're definitely seeing a shift away from it. But I think at the same time, we gave it a few months, and I think people who maybe didn't jive with those games fully started coming back or like people just decided they wanted to stick around or you get newer players who don't really vibe with a lot of the newer stuff coming in and like oh this game looks different the game's benefit as well as the game's so cheap like if you wait for this game on a sale it is insane how cheap it goes i think for like the last year it has been like 50 percent off and like on and off again with every other sale and then the last sale that they had like a month or two ago, it was like 60% off, which is insane considering every single character that is DLC is just part of the base game. Like they were never paid for. They were always free and it would just update with your game. Uh, the only real DLCs they had were like the, the Melty Blood Archives, which just gives you like 
art and like a document talking about the game's history and then like announcement voices which is like nothing like you don't need it you could just buy the base game the base game itself is fifty dollars which is probably a little pricey but if you get the game for like 60 percent off that cuts over half the price and it's a really easy barrier to entry that a lot of more traditional newer fighting games like street fighter or tekken hell even undernight you may not quite get that same investment from it um so the state of the, the game itself involving the DLC is like, yeah, the game isn't really getting updated uh, like that anymore, but it's kind of in a good place for it despite that. And because of where it is, it's got a good way of hooking newer players in, especially since the updates are really good. So if there does come a time where we get a new title and they go, oh, uh, here's a Melty Blood Tumina, you now have a developed base of people who like type Lumina that can go, okay, new game, and I can put my time into it. And assuming there's a decent carryover from Lumina to Tumina as a function, then you could see a lot of... You could see that initial investment of people during this 2024, 2025 time really pay off when that game comes out. And uh, Kuro in the chat makes a good point. It is free on PSN. I believe if you just have PlayStation, uh, PlayStation Plus... It's just like one of the free games involved I in that. I think you're right. Uh, don't quote me yeah. on that chat. I think that's correct. I know it at least was like a part of it for a while. I think it might still be. But considering that like the ease of access, I know the few times I've like popped in on ranked for PlayStation, there's constantly new players, super beginner level, who are just dabbling with the game and get interested in it. Um, and that's a great way to, to kind of invest in a player base, even on a more casual level. Because I'll be honest, I think as a fighting game, this game's so fun casually. You, this is run around, press buttons, a video game, and it feels really good for it. So I think, I think where it is, despite like the beginning of this year looking kind of dreadful, I think there's a lot of people who are properly invested in this franchise and in this game itself that. It's honestly in a like a decently healthy space that could that has a lot of room for growth, even without the the amounts of DLC that people might want from it. Okay. Uh, so we talked about the balance and patching on it. We talked about the state of DLC. Um, this one I was gonna delve into the popularity of it between forced popularity or favoritism with people in game titles, but. Honestly, it doesn't feel like the, nothing Nothing about Melty Blood was forced. Everything was just lovingly invited. So I don't really need to delve into that area of uh, my discussion outline. The most forced it is, is someone sitting at the back of their local with a Melty Blood setup, with a second controller, and just dabbling in the training mode and hoping people get interested. Uh, it's kind of awkward to try and force someone to, to play a, a game like that. The most peer pressure you're going to get is like, oh, everyone's playing this and all the people you know are playing this. You should play it. But it's not really like that with a lot of Lumina. But people are open to dabble. I think like even with the Undernight people, Undernight people are cool to dabble with Lumina. Lumina people want to dabble with Undernight. Same thing with Actors again. And same thing with other games. As long as you give them an environment to feel like they're welcome to even just try the game out, it's good. Okay. Um, next question I had was about the the IP for the game, which uh, is the, the, talking about the game's continuity versus the manga continuity, and then which one really helps the scene and the media more in order to grow Melty Blood's IP, or the IP of, its, of, of where it comes from. I... I'm trying to think on how I want to ask that, because Undernight was another one I did want to go into, but I didn't want to delve into it too much, because I know we may not know a, like, a, like a lot, a lot about Undernight. But it was, it was a two halves of the same coin type of deal, since they were both made by the same company, and they both kind of have a similar, well, at least for the current step, for the competitive aspect. It feels like it has a current falling off point from that, from a similar dryness or lack of uh, marketing that, that could be happening right now in order to compensate. I think for Undernight's case, it being an Arxis published game is kind of awkward for it, but the scene itself is so 
it's so noticeable and so on the map specifically for its lack of presence and more like its grassrootness. Not not like a presence. It's so grassrooted at this point that like it's kind of okay, I think, in a sense. The people who really like the game are really good at showing it off. Um, and that's I don't think that's an issue. For Lumina and Melty Blood in general as an IP, it has, again, it has the benefit and the curse of being a Type Moon property. So on the one hand, people will definitely know about it when they just go into the Type Moon rabbit hole. But on the other hand, um, because you are affected by when stuff might get released... Things like, I don't know, uh, the Red Garden hasn't been released yet for the like the second part of the visual novel. Um, that can definitely hurt it as like a, a fighting game IP, I guess, because it directly impacts the amount of content that can come in for the fighting game right now. But because it has even just the currently running man manga, Piece of Paradise, uh, it has the remake that just came out, it still exists on its own. And the biggest thing is the fact that Melty Blood characters have appeared in Fate Go, which makes five quadrillion dollars every year or something like that. Like, yeah. like the most, the biggest thing um, recently was over the summer they released uh, CL into the game uh, as a, I guess as a servant, and everyone freaked the fuck out about it. And it was around that time that they uh, also did the latest Lumina patch. Um, it being tied into that game alone, where that game definitely has an investment of people uh, into it. It uh, it gets more eyes that of people that are more invested in Fate than they are Tsukihime or in Melty Blood get to see some of these characters in action and go, oh, okay, now I'm interested. I think as the IP itself, it can go in and out between that and itself, but... I think Tsukihime also existing in this nebulous period where it was originally this really old vi visual novel from 2000 that was a progenitor in many ways to a lot of what fate would become. There's also like a growing interest in that. And there's also, we didn't even talk about really the crossover between it and Mahoyo or, or Witch on the Holy Night, which also got its visual novel released in English a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, it's one of those, oh, our, our IP crosses over with itself a bajillion times. So if you're invested in one thing, you might like the next thing. Uh, I think I think it's in a good spot because of that in terms of its IP. It's just the, the main thing that can hurt it is um, when it's allowed to do things, which kind of hurts. Uh, I just looked up the revenue numbers. So last year, by September of 2023, Fake Go made $7 billion dollars. That's just that's just the mobile app. That's just the thing you're dabbling with on your phone. That's a lot of money. I think yeah. as long as uh, Project as uh, Type Moon recognizes, I hope I haven't been saying Project Moon. Those are apparently two different things. Uh, as long as Type Moon decides that they see an interest in keeping this series going, I feel like they would. Um, and I think they have value within its characters. Like how we've seen, I think Sion was in Fate Go a few years ago. Um, so they understand that this character has an audience and that they would like to use them more. It's just a matter of getting the, the current narrative to a point where they can do it. So I think the IP itself is probably going to last another 50 years at least. Um, the, the main people behind it could be gone, and I think they'd still find a way to keep it all going with new writers and new designers and whatnot but i think even within like the next five years whether we even get a new uh visual novel or not the ip will still be pretty valuable and as long as the scene itself stays with it it's like yeah we can we can kind of wait whenever we just you know like it sooner rather than later you know yeah and just to help expand the options another thing i wanted to bring into that if it was also helping the ip or not was the uh the it, the kinetic novel that was also published by Type Moon. It was called Witch on the Holy Night. It was another one I wanted to bring in. I don't know how much that helped directly, but a lot of people really like that novel. I'm still reading through it myself. I, so I, I bought it when it first released, because it only released, I think, for Switch and PS4 physically. And then it later got a Steam release. And I only really started reading it once the Steam release came out. But a lot of people are like, we really want to support this, so they keep bringing in their English, their, their stuff in English. 
Because, like, the biggest thing was, like, if you wanted to play Fate, the original Fate, I think you literally needed to, like, get the best version. It would be a fan translation. And then, if you wanted to read Tsukihime, it was a fan translation. And then, for the remake, even, we only had the fan translation. So, Witch of the Holy Knight was a really big thing, because it was like, if we support this release in English, they might translate Tsukihime. And that would be huge. And then they that would did. Be really, really huge. Yeah, and then they did with the remake. They brought it out in English properly. And there's a lot to be said about the the English translation of Mahoyo. Even for just like the parts I've read, it's not it's not the best translation. But then they released Sukihime remake, and that translation is really good. Um, I think that, so I think Mahoyo had a really big effect on Type Moves, uh, idea of building out towards the West where they recognized, oh, we actually do have a decently sized audience here that we can get interested outside of, say, Fate Go that we could tap into. We also had the recent release of the, the Fate Stay Night remake or the remaster mm -hmm. for, uh, for, uh, Steam, which I've also, I'm currently streaming through since I've never played through Fate before. And I think seeing the amount of money and, and revenue that they can make off that is a good way of saying, hey, you should just release more things here. Um, I mean, I, those aren't even the only things, but it's the visual novels where it kind of established its base and where like the main stories are. And then they have a lot of stuff kind of branching off that, like other animes and, and series and whatnot. But I think the visual novels in general doing well, especially internationally, uh, makes a pretty big difference for the overall IP. Okay. Okay, let's see here. Next thing I was going to go into and that I wanted to ask was uh, what well, we went into the games community, which is the manga. I guess substance wise, <clears throat> substance wise when it comes to the, the FGC community or with even with Melty Bloods community. What do you think might be like one of the setbacks to the fight to the to the fighting game community? To the fighting game community as a whole? Um That's a tricky question cuz each community kind of has to interact with it different. Like some it's there isn't really the biggest setback is just going to be like dealing with the corporation that your game is a part of. So, like, there are going to be issues, like, with Tekken and Street Fighter sometimes. Like, I know there was that whole debacle with Tekken where some players from certain regions weren't allowed to participate in, like, their final cut or something like that. I can't really comment specifically on that, but those are going to be the things you deal with when your company has a decent chunk invested in the, the, the game itself, but they also have a lot of international things to deal with. But that's not even a necessarily a fighting game thing. I still remember around the times when um, there was the issue with Blizzard and uh, the situation in Hong Kong where um, some ca uh, casters got punished when one of their players, when a player said uh, Free Hong Kong during a broadcast and everyone kind of got punished for that. The commentators who didn't even say anything who were just a part of that got punished for it. Those are the kind of incidents, I guess, that'll happen in a scene if they're really big. On a more grassroots level, you can have things as bad as, like, the Melee and the P-plus communities, where they can barely even play their fucking game sometimes, because their main corporate interest is Nintendo, and Nintendo can just suck a lot for that. And there's going to be the trials and tribulations of even the newer games running, with all the sorts of things that they want to do with it, um, between that and the grassroots community. For Lumina and Actress Again... French bread is really chill about a lot of that stuff. Like we have a, for M back, we have the full caster, the rollback concerto, like and the game's perfectly fine. Like no one ever has a fuss. It's like, Oh, you're running caster in, a, in the game separately. Like every actress again, player is going to be the first person to say, you should buy this on steam and then get the caster. So they want to make sure that they support the developers. Uh, for Lumina, it's very similar, where it's just like, yeah, you should buy Melty Blood type Lumina. One of the, I don't know if it was a sticker or like a GIF, um, a lot of people like to post every time the game goes on sale, and they post whatever GIF they were using for the sale that time. Mm -hmm. um, our main tribulations at the moment are just making sure that the scene itself 
still has people that are interested and has its own identity and that we still can play the game that we really enjoy and just share it with more people. That's like the main trial for Lumina is the game's still really good. The game is still new and hip. It just isn't in that same limelight, but it doesn't need that. So it's just a, a matter of keeping hold of what we've got and saying, yeah, we we can we can run with this. This is this is good. I guess it's it can be kind of nice sometimes to be a little more obscure and not in that light uh, where you can just kind of do what you would like to do. And as long as you and the small knit community you have are all vibing together, it can all be pretty chill. Okay, I like this answer. That that does pretty much add a pretty good perspective to push on what are pending setbacks for the fighting game community when you when you boil down to sometimes it may not be a community thing, but it may just be a company thing or maybe a marketing thing. Yeah, it's it's rough because a lot of I think a lot of things get highlighted as oh it's the fighting game community issue or it's X game issue when it comes to when things happen. But it's like a lot of that shit happens because people are people and we're kind of within a grander society that has these issues and naturally parts of that are going to go into its own microcosm. So our societies within our own fighting games are going to have issues that we have to tackle in every community and every person is going to tackle them differently. It's just, you know, it's just a matter of handling them, I guess. Um, and some will do it differently. Uh, we got a lot of younger people in here, a lot of older people in these scenes and how they kind of interact and how things go will just be dependent on the people in there. Uh, it's it's why I kind of shudder at times when like people talk about like the Strive community in a way, or like the the Ultimate or Smash communities in a way, where it's just like some of these people are just talking about this stuff and things come out and then they try to do something about it and it gets more publicized than other ways. And, but... granted, and granted, yeah, that is one way to establish change is because if you talk about it enough or if you I get similar to like a petition, if you talk about it enough or you put it in a media or a general lens that has enough trafficking, it can create change. It doesn't always mean that it will. Of course. Yeah. No and again, it's the first step to change. Yeah. And how things change, I mean, that's a whole nother bag of worms. How do you want it to change? Can you bring it in a way that it does change? And how many things are you going to step on before people start to get a, a little more uppity about it? I think for Lumina, there has been a, a little bit of a purge of what people would be like is just things they don't want to interact with as much within the scene but when you get a bigger bigger scene um it, it can be a lot harder there's also the the need of both we want to get our people out there and, and promote ourselves but we also don't want to put ourselves on a a grander stage than we need to be on um which is weirdly enough not to I, I, that's, that's, that's one of the better aspects of a small community is because it's easier to keep tabs on a lot of things like that individually and collectively both yeah, it's, it's, it's also a double-edged thing where you don't want to har harvest or develop a scene that harbors kind of a, a, a get-off-me kind of idea or like a, a community that can be a little more aggressive or just really awkward to interact with. Yeah, uh, like abrasive change. You don't want that. Yeah, you don't want that, but you don't also want to get stuck into these pre-existing notions of things where it gets really standoffish for new people because... You, you you act a sort of way or this whole group kind of is a way um they give off the wrong vibes yeah vibes are a very very good way to put it so it, it's it's an idea that you should really try and be welcoming and you should be open to a lot of people and ideas uh that just some communities may not have as well and i think lumina more recently is in a good spot for that where people are more open and this kind of tackles back into what i was talking about earlier which is the idea of creating content and ideas where people see the passion. Yeah. yeah. It's all, it all kind of adds up. You want to have good vibes when people join the community. You want to be helpful for when people are trying to get into things. You want to have the content that's there so that people understand things and can get invested in it. And as long as all the vibes are good, then there should be no reason why people don't even stick around just casually. It doesn't even have to be full on competitive, but people interact with the game in all sorts of ways that the community isn't just made up of a bunch of people that like to fight each other. A lot of it's like, 
I like playing this game because I get to find new ways to do combos and things. Or I like to interact with this community because I love the the characters and maybe adding designs or doing other things. There's so much more than just pressing buttons for these games that it it, it is most important to have your community be open and welcoming uh, to a wide berth of people while still having the the idea of keeping those people safe uh, in case of turbulent times. Yeah. Honestly, having, having an open-minded community is one of these these things that benefits a community because you can approach a game outside the pedestrian perspective of just playing it to fight or just playing it to press buttons. There's more to love about yeah. the game that is brought to light. Yeah, I think what I've loved about the the fighting game community a lot, at least the ones I've been a part of, is just how welcoming it is to a lot of LGBT people. Because as someone, I, I've grown up kind of away from like major cities, so I never really got that interaction until I was like starting to get into high school. And even then, it was like not much. It was, it was like uh, I had to join the community first to understand it. And it, it's it was generally cool to get to meet a lot of people like that. And I think Lumina in particular, it can be kind of hard sometimes being from a state where uh, legally uh, there's a lot of issues when it comes to other people from out of state coming in of different persuasions where, uh, unfortunately, the, the direct political and legal ramifications of them being here can be kind of awkward for people. So you have to find other ways around that to develop your scene or to to interact with those people to keep them safe and to make sure they're doing good. Understood. Um, and it, it can be, it can be super rough to, to get around that. But I think the benefit of our scene is no matter what happens, we all are kind of unified under a, a, cons a joined unifier of, we all really like this game and we all get together well, and we can all hang out together. Um, even when the, the world might be on fire, no matter when it is or no matter where it is. Uh, we at least have a nice little safe haven here to enjoy this and to, to have fun. It's the it's the community aspect of the fighting game community that I don't think you get from a lot of other hobbies, interests, competitions. Uh, that makes it really good. Yeah, it's like a it's, it's it's a nice little slice of life for a game, for a community, and for healthy interacting interacting and engagement for the community with itself like the community this is one of few games where the community really does take the time to interact with itself on a daily basis outside oh for game, sure but through it no my favorite thing is especially for lumina i'm not as much into the actress again community as a whole but i've definitely chatted with a good amount of people about it it's uh lumina's funny because you have you have general chat and then you have general chat too, which is looking for games. And there's like just different people that will ch chat about different normal general things and looking for games. But that's like not even the only chat. Like if I just randomly hopped into like the pets channel, people just be posting about their pets or like other stuff outside of this. I love when we go to events and we organize things. We've organized some really big get togethers. Um, best thing about like evo in 2023 was just like room hopping and i'd never done as much room hopping as i had done at that event with how big it was um that that personness is really important to a scene um in and out of the game be it you're going out for some food or some drinks or you're playing in uh, the game as serious as you can it's really really nice to to have the community interact as well as it does like that Heck, I met you through it. I met a lot of our friends through it. I met uh, a couple other prospective TOs, a couple of which that aren't around anymore. Uh, Jcom, I met through there. Jcom was one of like the most enriching guys that I met that really helped me to still keep engaging with the video games community. Yeah, no, Jcom. I, I talked about it the other day. Uh, so I yesterday I streamed really late into the night talking about ways to. To work on content they engage the community but one of the things i talked about was jcom himself he's he is one of those people when you want to talk about like oh there's no aura anymore in the fighting game community i don't think people when they say that understand the true like risk and mental cost it can have on someone where they put themselves up and say i'm better than you and i think i'm going to do really well 
and I'm willing to start banter and to to get people engaged through being a personality that not a lot of you have. It's scary. It's it's really nerve wracking to do that. Um, I've attempted to do stuff like that, but it's so hard to a do it and b do it right. And Jcom, he's got a lot of charisma for that. Um, he's really and he's really down to earth when you talk to him. I think is he's got the best. He does the best of it. He's very outward. He's willing to say his piece. He's not willing to let people just talk their shit and not have like pushback. He's willing to put himself out there. But then you also have the side of him who's really able to help you out. He's really willing. He's super nice to to promote the game and to help you improve that. Like, I think he is like the the ideal in that that sense. He's very strong at um, getting people engaged. There's other people I think that do a similar job like that. I think Kikoho. Oh, so fucking funny. Um, he may be seeming a little sillier, but then you lock he locks in and you're like, oh, this guy, he's actually really good. And he'll uh, he'll put Kiko. a lot of people on his bank. Yeah, Kikoho. So Kikoho is uh one of the the main TOs for Panic Shield Anonymous. He's the one who put together the the circuit. He's also a top level work player. Um he's got an identity all on its own. Um I would like to there's also talk with that dude. I have heard he was pretty funny. No, he's so like one of the things we did at Climax at night. So he was the the main runner of the fundraiser to get some players out, which was very last second. Um, and he helped organize that super quick. Uh, and we ended up making a few stretch goals. And one of the stretch goals was literally him, me, and I volunteered, and one of our invitees, which was Hayasaka from Chile. And we said if we get to a certain amount of money. At climax of night, we will eat raw onions. Hey, yo. And like, as soon as we released that, the fundraiser got met immediately. Ain't no damn and, way. Like, it, it may have been over the course of like an hour. <laughs> oh my goodness. And then <laughs> there were a few other ones, but that was like the main one. So <laughs> fast forward to Thursday night, climax of night. Kikoho has a bag of three onions, one for each of us, and some mouthwash <laughs> so that we could cleanse our mouth afterwards. And we're standing in the parking lot and we're just waiting. <laughs> like oh for uh, I think for Hayasaka to come over. <laughs> and we eat the onions, and there's a whole little video of us doing that. Um Could you at there's least like toppings with that? Or you gotta just No, eat this was this do I need? I'll send you the video because Kikoho did send me the video. Actually, he posted it on the the, the PSA uh, Twitter as well. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, no, this was a genuine. He had a bag of onions he got at the store, and then he brought them to us in a bag. I peeled our onions, and then we ate the onions. Um, it was. Like in the moment, it was like it was a little nerve wracking, and definitely it hit the stomach a little hard. But then it was also like this was really fucking funny. <laughs> it sounds like it was a good time. I called you. Yeah, no, and then just hanging out with Kikoho in general is just really funny. Um, I remember I mentioned I made that trip up to to Hog Dark Side, so he is the head TO of Lumina up there. He he developed the the Lumina scene over in Connecticut, and now Connecticut is like. Top three best uh, regions in the country, probably. If you add them included with Tri-State, they're probably the best. Um, and he, I was up there, and we were talking shit. We went on a walk for, like, steamed hams. You get a lot of uh, personality between him and, like, the rest of the Connecticut folks um, in terms of how you interact with people. Uh, I know Scrot. Scrot can be a, a very a vocal proponent uh, proponent of stuff and and be very uh, out there and outspoken. Um, so even if he doesn't like pop up occasionally, like he's been on the big Street Fighter grinds, but people still know him. Uh, we have people within the Lumina community that have this presence and identity that um, that I think draw people in when they kind of learn about it. It's just a matter of like showing people, but it's all really scary. To be at the the top of a fighting game, even on like a smaller community, can still be a little nerve wracking when you want to get engaged with things. Um, and I think that's kind of the the confusion for a lot of people in other fighting game uh, spaces to work it back to that. Like, 
people don't necessarily don't have aura anymore. The the playing field is more even, and people aren't willing to put themselves out like that, and the stories aren't being developed like that. Um, I think, I think melee like those stories. People, yeah, and that that would be on other people to develop it. I know there was another narrative going around of like, oh man, we need more fighting game people to to make not content that isn't just them playing the game. And then you sit down and it's like, that's a lot of effort, especially for people who really want to play the game. And that's why I've been stressing about um, working on that. And I think Lumina will be kind of in that threshold. But it's it's not to say it's not there. If we, There's a whole nother conversation that needs to be had. Then maybe this isn't the place for it. For the fact that non fighting game videos, not directly about the fighting game, are really hard to sell to an audience. Even the the best of the best content, even like the melee sphere, is really hard to like get that hit consistently. It um, is because like because you have to be it has to be in the right taste first of all, and then two it has to the person who's delivering that message or delivering the content has to be like a social type of person. I wouldn't even say that. It's more of just you can have everything go right. But you're A, talking about a very niche section of a game that may already be niche, and you're also having to make sure that said community even interacts with it so it it gets that interest, and you're also having to develop its own audience outside of that. I think Melee does it the best because they've done it, I think, for the longest, personally. Um, But even then, they still can struggle with that, and oftentimes it's just like trying to keep up with that when there is a small but noticeable demand for it, uh, it can be hard to, to keep it up. A lot of this stuff in general, be it being good at pressing the buttons or making the content, big, making the content outside of it, um, you're, you're putting yourself out there at the end of the day. People don't just make a documentary and are like perfectly well suited for it. You're not going to get your history of this game or this character without putting a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it and not even sure if it's going to come out well and people are going to watch it. Same thing with the fighting game. You don't know if even if you do well and you play well and you put in that investment, if it's going to mean as much to people around you. Um, You just kind of have to go and shoot your shot and do your best. And I think Melty's in that point where people are starting to want to step up more and to find ways to do that, that other scenes maybe through how big they are or how open it is don't feel like as much of a pressure to do that but maybe as they develop more and more you'll start to see that more okay and again that's not to say that's not to say that they don't i've seen so many examples from this scene that have these there people might just be either too picky or like no i want this specific thing which is make that thing yourself you can do it or it's not really having the val the putting the value into what's already out there, which is equally as awkward for the people who are putting themselves out like that. True, because there there is an awkward fence that you do got to kind of work behind sometimes, or work around, or work past. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Next thing was uh, last two questions. One. Uh, what is it that you seek from the game or from its community? Like, where do you, where do you see it going from the now? Um, I see it still being pretty popular. I think 2025 will be a pretty uh, rejuvenated year. I think we're getting to the climax of, like, how much people are putting into this game of the newer people, and they're really going to start going to town at these offline events that they're going to. Um, Frosty's combo breaker slash back slash back's going to be your tournament to pay attention to because a lot of east coast people are looking to make the trip out Ooh, um, okay. we've got crossover arc that's slated sometime in august that's going to be awesome um and then we have climax of night seven next year officially confirmed and i think people are going to be working for that i know a lot of american players are hungry for run backs against some of the japanese players i know a lot of the other international players are looking to get that run back and that should be a good time i think the best time to get into this game specifically is right now. <laughs> you want to get in, you want to learn, you want to meet people, and the culmination is probably going to be a climax, but there's going to be a lot of times that you can come out to events in the lead-up to that that'll be a great investment. But, like, the biggest thing, 
game's just really fun. <laughs> like, I don't even think they could even do an update that would mess it up. The game is kind of peak. <laughs> Uh, and I, I can't. I don't think I, I stressed it enough properly. I have never played a game that has gone back to like the the primordial soup that was the beginning of games, where the the wonder of playing a video game was you got to run around and jump around at like ways that you as a person couldn't. And Lumina just says, "Why are we limiting ourselves to small shimmies and being in the air for two seconds and then exploding?" What if you had the freedom to run and jump around? And I think that that freedom, when more and more people get to find that out or get to experience it, is what makes the game so special and is what is going to keep people playing uh, it well at, into the next few years. Okay. And then to close out the question segment, uh, what is your takeaway from the gaming journey thus far that you've had and the road that's still traveled? Sorry, you could re can you repeat that? I was checking something. Sorry. Sure. Uh, what's your takeaway from the gaming journey thus far that you've had and the road still traveled? There are a lot of communities, especially smaller communities, that I, I really jive with. Um, it doesn't really matter the the specific game I'm playing. I, I've really known that for like Melee, for 64, for P+, and the same thing for Melty Blood. I don't... At the end of the day, I personally do not care how many people I have to play this game. If I just even have a few friends that I can make that really enjoy playing a game, that's all I kind of need, because those will be the happiest days of what I'm doing. Um... As for my journey with after this, it's I still want to help those communities get bigger because I think they deserve it. But I'm just happy as I am now to have what I have. But I also do have the passion to try and expand it into the future. So you'll you'll be hearing from me doing more of my thing to try and, and get people out there uh, despite anything in life or the, the work or the the other life things i want to make sure that i'm doing my part to, to help out where i can and if that means getting people into this game it's good if that means helping people travel out to things um i think one of the the happiest things i've ever done is brought bring medusa out to events um or just like drag other people to events that they otherwise wouldn't be like i couldn't have imagined like going to climax without him i couldn't imagine going to like evo without him I brought friends like uh, my friend Radian out to his first out of state Smash 64 event. Like, it's the personness tied in with the community and the game that is so important to me. And I don't see that stopping anytime soon. And I think that's what I want to continue doing uh, as I continue my my journey within the the overall gaming community. I really love that answer. That's a really good unified perspective on like not even like where you're going but where you go that has a ripple effect around you i i really love that yeah it's it can be really difficult to um to overstate how like even like the the smaller people within a community relative like even if you don't think you you were inter interacting as much as you think you were you do you do have a presence that can be felt and you can always do a lot to increase that if you want to, or you don't really have to. Um, there's no measuring stick for this kind of thing, but people will, uh, will respect and accept when you do try and put yourself out there like that. And it doesn't matter how much you try or how much you fail, as long as you kind of keep going at it, people really do value that, um, no matter what it is. Uh, and it's always really cool to get to just interact with the same people every day and be like, Oh, Hey, you want to you play some games or you want to talk about this? Um, even outside of the fighting games themselves, we talk about like, <laughs> I've had some of my most fun experiences being like, yo, we're going to play 100% OJ. <laughs> talk about it in comms or talk about like Toho or something. Um, <laughs> it's definitely a, a fun part of that, but you, it doesn't take it doesn't take a lot to, to kind of make a mark on a, a community like that. So even just being a part of it 
vicariously or being a part of it just casually is 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 more than enough for a lot of people um but it's also nice to shout out people that do really commit to to the extra part that you wouldn't expect to have okay all right let's see here okay and i'm just now watching this thing here in the back do you mind if i pull it up on stream sure okay let me see here all right, Chad, I also wanted to show you guys real quick. This is what he was talking about regarding the the fundraiser thing that they that they had come to pass. And they had the, the live onion thing here. Oh, my God. So this is me peeling. I think this is, is this my onion or is this? So I peeled everybody's onions. I would like that to me known. Um, I had to be the adult in the room. That's me with the curly hair, by the way. Hi, that's me. Um, I, this is like 10 minutes after we were initially slated the start. I'm like, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to eat these onions. Uh, Hayasaka is there with the purple onion. There's Kikoho with the other one. Okay. Um, and I'm going to, you probably want to fast forward a little bit because I'm going to have to go over and peel Hayasaka's onion as well. Uh, and we have this little dabble. So before Hayasaka came down, um, <laughs> there was already a group of us there and we started doing a little naming thing. Like, okay, everyone say who you are. And we're going to go in a circle. Let's get to know each other. And then it was like, okay, now we can actually do this. And we also had the trash bags in case anyone threw up or anyone needed to just throw things out. And, and this was going to be the start of it. Um, and this is the, the countdown. And just take a big old bite of that. This is a nice <laughs> you you want to know? I, go on. I, might actually, know. <laughs> I would actually do this. Like I have eaten raw onions before. I would do that. Because at first, I, I, when I was younger, I didn't like raw onions. But as I got older, I did love raw onions. I'm going to be 100%. Don't eat raw onions like this. <laughs> It it's bad. Like it'll get into your stomach and it'll sit there if you eat it like this. Because we're eating through like multiple layers of it. You're getting the juices in there and oh, it'll Lord. get you. I'm taking it right now, but it definitely it, it was a a thing that was happening. Um, it also can can depend on the onion. Like the onion I had wasn't too bad, but I know Haya with the purple onion that one's like super sharp. Um, we were all kind of feeling it. Uh, I have already said that next year we will be eating grilled onions and we will be enjoying them. I about to say, I think of... that's a bit better for the grilled onions. Yeah. Actually, another really funny thing that happened is I, I, so I ate the most of the onion that I had, but Kiko, like, he started passing around his onion and people started taking it, like, just other bites of his onion just to, like, it, like a solidarity bite, um, which was not planned at all. But it was just, like, a part of the moment people were in there. And, like, the entire rest of the night, it was, yo, we heard someone was eating onions. <laughs> it was just people eating raw onions out in the, the, like, the entrance of the hotel. You heard right. No, it was, it was really funny. And those are one of those things. So, like, we were talking about, like, sometimes you get, like, a little bit of a stigma where it's, like, oh, you, you play, you play the fighting game in the bathroom. I'm, like... I view that kind of as like, A, it's pretty funny, and also, yeah, it's just kind of like a dedication thing, and that people don't really get it. Um, this is one of those things where, yeah, the, you know, they were just, we just had these Melty Blood players, and they were just outside eating raw onions. Don't really know what was up with that. It's it's really funny. These are the developments of like certain in jokes that are are really good. Uh, another one is the uh, the at Steam James in joke between the the Looking for Games channel. Um, so like instead of saying at Steam Games, which is Steam paying for the console, which it would be the PC Steam release, and then instead of saying games, you say James. And that's like the entire bit. And then people just do that sometimes. And then it kind of culminated really funnily. Um, I at CEO this year, I was like, they have these like wrestling signs because CEO is like a wrestling th themed event. And I got a sign that just said at Steam James. And then I brought it again with me uh, to Climax to have it <laughs> there. So I would just had to have it every so often, like in the crowd or um, when we were doing exhibitions to kind of do this. Oh yeah, there we go. We got people eating the uh, <laughs> eating the onion. Yep, eating the other one, the the solidarity. Yeah, and there's about. Yeah. yeah, and there's Kikoho taking the chaser, just getting some mouthwash in his mouth so he can maybe not have a complete amount of onion. <laughs> yeah, no, and, and my, my favorite part I had mentioned before while we were waiting for Haya, I was like, oh, yo, we should just like do push-ups, like fuck it. And then uh, Kikoho and I like go to the side and then start doing push-ups right after eating this onion. Actually, hang on, um, I'll do that real quick. 
Hey, look at that. Yeah. I, I gotta say, the few people that took a bite out of that hush puppy, that's a pretty good amount of bites for that. For that. No, yeah, that's we, we were... Onion. So our thing was, like, we're not going to try and eat the whole onion, because that's, like, really dangerous. But we're going to yeah. try and do as best as we can. And we took bites. We were fucking chomping on it. It was... <laughs> Like, when I say, like, my stomach, like, started feeling that, like, an hour or two later, those bites, those add up. They they really do. Good evening, everyone. I saw movie night, so I don't know if we were watching a movie or not. Hey, hey, welcome. Oh, we're just getting ready to conclude the podcast in a couple minutes. We're just, I got it up, uh, we're just going over the, um, the, uh, the challenge that, um, our coma here and his friends were doing once they finished the, uh, the fundraiser challenge. But this was a this is a really good event. I do see the I do see the, the inside joke on this one, and I I love that so many people really got in on this, and it, it makes a really nice memory, especially outside. The yeah, hotel. no, yeah. This is literally the the sliding glass doors are to the left there by like a hundred feet maybe. Um. So originally it was like we weren't really sure like we maybe do it in the hotel, and then I tell Kikoho I'm like we we really shouldn't in case someone throws up, and we were gonna go a little <laughs> further away. But um, no, I was like, you know what, this is fine. We'll do it right here. And it was kind of great because everyone got a good eyes view of what the fuck we were doing. Um, and no, this is this is the thing that makes that makes the memories. Uh, another one was uh, I remember organizing a a group visit to a Benihana's at Frosty's. So my first year at Frosty's, I found out the hotel I was staying at was right next to a Benihana's, and I did go there once. Then. Just before uh, this year's, um, when I went to Hog Dark Side to visit Kikoho and the rest of Connecticut's uh, at the the regional they held, uh, we did this thing called the Gauntlet, where after the bracket, I had all the Connecticut people that were still there play me in a first to three, and that's a whole like can of worms. I, I have that whole thing recorded on my YouTube channel, but one of the things that Kikoho did while he was there was he started uh, quoting um, Dracula Flow. Uh, if you haven't seen that um, banger video, uh, but one of the ones he quoted, one of the lines he quoted was, "They needed an undercover agent, so I br- I burned my fingertips off at the Benny Hanna hot- on the hot plate at Benny Hanna's. They will never find me." And I started talking with some of the melty people in relation to Frosties, and I was like, "Yo, we should totally just go to Benny Hanna's, just like for the bit." Uh, and then we did. I ended up organizing like 20 Melty Blood people across like almost three tables uh, to go to this Benihana. And it's those specific things that are just so funny. This being able to try and do those things. They're not always going to succeed and they're not always going to be the best experiences probably. But like those are just it's just about the moments as well. And you're all coming together with like minded people to enjoy just enjoy life sometimes in the little bit of time you get before you go back to doing what else you're doing. Uh, Absolutely. Oh, that is nice. I would definitely like to take part in one of those challenges myself. All right, chat, but that will bring us to a pretty adequate wrap up point here for uh, our Comas podcast. Feel free to. Feel free to hit him up here on socials, here on Blue Sky, and on Twitter, here on Arcoma Mudkits at Home, here on Twitter, Twitch, YouTube, I believe also, or is that Zeb Uh On YouTube, I am Arkma underscore Muddy Kips there. It's my Twitter that is the Zeb Strika. Um... I don't use my Twitter as much. I'm mostly just using that for branding. If you want to follow my random takes, like whatever I'm deciding to cook or something, uh, I post that on my Blue Sky now. Um, slowly trying to move away from that <laughs> cursed X app, but I have too many cool things on there that I'm like, man, this is that's fair. This. That's fair. There's the the imbalanced balance. But yeah, on my YouTube, so I'm not actually just an FGC content creator. Uh, I, I actually started my channel back in 2020. Uh, because I, I had a lot of games I wanted to cover. Uh, I, I grew up with like Let's Plays and stuff, and those were really cool and a, a part of it, so I started doing that. Now my channel is very much like whatever the hell I want to do at this point. So I've got a lot of brackets that I've recorded or ran. I've got like Let's Plays of things like I'm playing through River City Girls with a friend of mine, uh, Radiant. 
Um, we've also done other videos like playing TF2 together that have been a fun time. And then you also have like bracket runs that I post on there. Uh, I remember I posted a, a rocket launch once that I saw on the beach. Uh, I, I post like literally anything and everything that you might want to see. Um, so if you want to follow that, feel free to do that. Uh, I also stream on Twitch, but yeah, I keep myself very open. But I appreciate getting a spot here tonight. I hope I got to explain some cool Melty Blood to y'all. Um, stay tuned for that. Uh, if you want to get into Melty Blood, I can recommend the Panic Shield Anonymous Discord. Uh, if you ever want to reach me on Discord, I am just Arkma, A-R-H-K-M-A. -A uh, my DMs are always open. I'm willing to help people with literally anything uh, getting into the game otherwise. And if you want to stay tuned tonight on my Twitch, I'll be hosting the Melty Blood Actress Again current code Florida Region Locked online event uh, where Florida gets its own little online thing to do uh, because I don't like playing West Coast West Coast lags, and at that point, I might as well just <laughs> separate Florida from everyone else so we can all develop a more universal online scene since uh, or online local since offline travel takes a lot of time for us. Right, and you gotta try and see if you can make it as accommodating as you can for the online via the East Coast, West Coast, so sometimes you gotta just separate the brackets just for the sake of online simplicity. For sure. Alright, I'm gonna go on ahead. All right, I'm gonna, we're going to go on ahead and have our closing point here for the podcast. I appreciate all you guys out there in the following here for Melty Blood, Lumina, and Actress again, and the media, and the manga, and the novels. As We got a chance to really take a delve here into Melty Blood past, present, and very gradually into its future here with one of the cornerstone engineers of communal creativity for the scene in modern day that's still doing his thing little by little to just bring love and awareness to the IP. If you guys have any other questions or concerns, feel free to also hit him up via the, the media here and what it is that he just also spoke of via Twitch, Twitter, X, quote unquote, or Blue Sky in order to learn more about Arkema or even the man behind the Mudkips himself. He has some pretty funny takes. Do take a listen. I am I am quite the yapper. <laughs> hey, we all are at heart. We all have a story to tell. Or a good joke to tell too. World needs laughter. Alright, chat, that'll be Rodimus Prime signing off here for our next episode of The Space Bridge. Feel free to tune in here at Rodimus Prime 1986, home of the Iacon Battle Circuit and Iacon Corp. You guys know where to find me? Stay tuned until The Space Bridge opens again. And like I always say, till all are one.